<laughs> okay, I think we can start. I'm gonna continuously be, be letting people in anyway. Um, Jen, do you want to start us off today? Okay, so yeah, so just a little introduction. Um, my name is Jen, and I study medical sciences. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the well, one of the outreach officers for GoLab for 2021 20, to 2022, and I'll be one of the co-hosts for today's session. <laughs> um, so, um, like Jen, I'm also going to be co-host today. My name's Sharissa Naidu. I'm in third year. I study maths and philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. And um, you guys would not know this, but Jen and I are both South African um, students. So we're born and raised in South Africa, and hence why we're particularly excited about intersectionality today. Um, Jen, over to you. Okay, so just a little introduction of GoLab for those of you on, who are new or don't know. So GoLab Edinburgh is a university society and part of the specific Global United Nations Foundation movement that aims to train and equip students who identify as females with skills needed to run university societies with the intention of uplifting women and catering to their needs in a society that undervalues them at every turn. Right, um, so with that in mind, and with us kind of explaining who GoLab is and what we do, I wanted to explain the intention of today's event. Um, so we wanted like an interactive event today to be held to ask experts about how best to understand this concept of intersectionality. Um, so that we all, as kind of gender equality advocates, as people that are fully against all forms of discrimination, so that we all have a working definition of what intersectionality is. Um, as well as the fact that like this month is Black History Month and um, GoLab kind of partners with the Black Ed Movement um, to, you know, in the project group, um, the Black Feminist Space. And so we've also put on this event as a Black Feminist Space um, event to inform and celebrate Black people, as well as their histories for this month. Um, but yeah, so the format of this panel discussion today, quite quickly, is going to be um, Jen and myself asking our panelists some questions, and then we'll give you guys, our attendees, the opportunity to kind of put in the chat bar any questions you may have for them, about 10 minutes to spare just before the session ends. Um, but yeah, Jen, to you. Yeah, so just before we start, um, just a few harsh rules. This is a respectful and non judgmental environment. We'd appreciate it if all attendees just kept their microphones and their cameras off just to avoid any distractions. Um, and then as co-host, we also reserve the right to remove any attendee who is not adhering to these house rules um, and keeping our promise to obviously ensure this is a space that is respectful and constructive. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. So we are joined today by three experts. And so I just want to ask um, each of you if you can just give like a brief explanation of who you are and what you do. Um, so Dr. Bento, you can go first and then you can be followed by Maureen and then Lara, if that's okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this uh, powerful invitation and a presentation uh, about this event and why we are here. It's always very important to contextualize the reasons and the importance to remember and move forward in relation to how Black History Month can be considered in our political agenda, but also in the agenda of our own identifications in the agenda of how, how we circulate fact uh, among each other. Um, my name is Katusha Bento, so you can all call me Katusha. And I am a lecturer in race and decolonial studies here at the Department of Sociology at the University of Edinburgh. I am also the associate director of Race Ed Network, which is a cross university talking about race, racialization, decoloniality, and coloniality. And I am also the co founder of the Black or the Afro Brazilian Free University in Brazil. I'm here just to share with you some of my my thoughts and understandings of the intersectionality, and I will move uh, 
the the microphone to Maureen. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maureen Martin. I'm based in the United States. I'm Afro Canadian. I was I I was born in Cameroon. Um, and my family immigrated to Canada where I was educated. My professional career has mostly been in the United States. I am a media consultant and uh, storyteller. And during the pandemic and the various riots, et cetera, that happened, and I'd say riots and marches that happened um, last year in the States, um, my response was to create an app and a civic um, design that would create um, safety for for uh, black people, black and brown people. Um, actually, the app works for everybody, but uh, the focus was really on the quality of life for people of color. Um, kind of um, disempowering uh, racism and and showing stakeholders the power of, of, of working to create a safer world and a better world for all of us, because no one wins with um, in a racist environment. You know, I, I perceive the future as needing multiple minds of every race to create and plan the future. We can't rely on um, white supremacy or, or white privilege or old boys network to create our future when most of the world is not white male. <laughs> most of the world is a, a blend of colors, right? And we need all of that brilliance to come up to help us create a better future. So that's the that's the kind of uh, message behind Black App. Hi, can I, should I talk now? Uh, okay, uh, my name's Lara, and I'm a third year student at the University of Edinburgh studying business with marketing, and I'm also the co-founder of Advancing Eve, a Scottish community interest company that aims to help women um, achieve their aspirations with our support, and um, we have founded Advance in Eve in 2020, myself and my mom, she's my um, co-founder, and it's grown massively since it started. So we've had corporate partnerships with the Royal Bank of Scotland and recently the University of Edinburgh um, through us collaborating on their Power Her Up programme to encourage um, female students to start their own enterprises. Um, I think that's why I'm here talking today. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I do have uh, my own unique insights that I hope um, help the conversation. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone, for sharing um, a brief outline of who you guys are and what you guys are here for. Um, right, so, Jen, do you want to ask the first question? Okay, sure. So, as Teresa said earlier, we are informing to celebrate this Black History Month. So, with that in mind, um, why do you think that intersectionality specifically is important when we talk about anti-racism? Um, anyone can start maybe Katusha again you can go first <laughs> just follow that order why intersectionality while we are uh, celebrating black history month that's the question right i i think it's very important to contextualize why intersectionality came about what is this concept because i think it's important to understand that intersectionality beyond or not only uh, as a as a feminist concept it is a concept that is from and or with the critical race studies so the critical race studies is coming exactly to challenge the construction of truth that is the Eurocentric, male, white-centric um, as the epicenter of knowledge. So what I'm trying to say here is not that Eurocentric views are wrong. What I'm saying is it's bad when it's trying to universalize everything from that perspective. So by when we are talking about critical race studies, we are talking about a different way to engage critically in how we understand society, understanding that race, racialization and racism are constructs from the coloniality, from a racist way to inform, not only form, but also inform who we are as a nation, 
as institutions, whether we are in the university or in a hospital and so on. So there are practices and discourses that are embedded in those um, in those institutions, in those ways that we identify. We identify with a flag, we identify with a country, we identify with a community, right? So critical race studies is trying to challenge not only the scholarship, because it's not only an academic movement, but it's also speaking to artists, activists, and so many other uh, people from the community, from the black community especially. Uh, but then, well, voices from indigenous communities, uh, South Asian communities joined the critical race studies. Okay, I'm giving you this context, and I'm sorry if I'm talking for too long, just to say that intersectionality comes within that context. In 1989, Kimberly Crenshaw said, we need to under understand the laws and how the lawsuits are having a different dynamic when we are talking about, for example, black women. Right, and she coined the concept when she analyzed this uh, this lawsuit uh, uh, from black women against General Motors, saying, "Look, we're black women. We're being sacked. Everyone has been sacked. We lost our jobs." And the and the judge says, "No, but they have white women in the offices, and they have black men." building the cars. How, what are you talking about? They have women and they have black. There is no way you have a case here. So this way of silencing, of ignoring systematically the voices of black women uh, represented a, a, a sign or maybe a, a very important analytical process to see that race and gender are intersecting in the way that black women were being in well, invisibilized or silenced in the making of a nation. It's not just a lawsuit. So how is that particular example can help us to understand how racism operates hand in hand with other categories that are uh, part of the way we are identified? And that's why intersectionality helps us to understand oppressions. Intersectionality is not about identities. We are all complex beings. We are all intersectional beings. That's okay. We are complex and it, that's rich, super cool. Intersectionality is about how we understand those oppressions. And that's why Black History Month is addressing to the systemic oppressions that black people are suffering uh, as a legacy of coloniality to situate nowadays that queer women, um, other other people, other groups, other communities who are who we call dissident with dissident identities are suffering racism from different perspectives. And I believe intersectionality sheds light to that particular way to see that inter that oppressions are not the same, right? It's not only about black people, it's about about different groups within the black community. Um, amazing answer, Katusha. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Jen, you can go ahead. No, I was just saying, yeah, amazing answer. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Maureen, you. if you want to continue or add a bit, um, <laughs> sure, that that was amazing. And I'm just going to add to that because uh, the discourse was just, you know, <laughs> uh, so in in the States, what's really interesting when we talk about um, racism and how it affects different categories, um, something that's really critical that affects us all is healthcare. You know that when they do um, when they do tests of new drugs and new, new treatments, um, something like 70% of the, of the test subjects are white male. So we're not even actually, our bodies aren't getting what they need. And so it's really important that on all levels of healthcare that, that everybody has a chance to be part of these trials. And uh, from, from the researcher point on, even uh, from the person who develops the, the, the drugs with, with the mindset of, I've grown up in a beige or a brown home. Um, I know that my family had particular issues and this is why I'm entering the medical profession as a researcher researcher or a scientist because their perspective is going to be very different from a white male, right? And then you go into um, the actual education experience and then you have the educators who are 
predominantly white male who are educating predominantly white males. Um, and maybe that's not so much the case anymore. But um, what happens is their perspective is that it's a white male who is the, the head of healthcare and, 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 and research and science. And so the whole perspective is skewed towards one group. And so everything that's approached, even, I mean, it's, it's really kind of depressing to, to think that all of the um, reproduction, um, reproductive health issues are run by men, you know? And um, so, so, and which doesn't make any sense, right? And this, which explains also why I, I, would, I would venture to say that some things are primitive because they haven't, uh, the research hasn't started from a female mindset where a woman is looking at, the, at what, what her body needs and how other women's bodies respond to particular issues and what, how, how things could be better treated, right? So if we, if we extend that to how uh, med med medicine is or treatments are made for skin, right? And it's always from white perspective. We'll never know what the best treatments are all the way down the line. So we need, we we really do need diversity and inclusion, not as just catchwords, but we need to have it integrated so that we can level up and really take care of everybody, right, in this world and treat them better. And, and uh, yeah, that's my thoughts. Well, thank you so much for that. It's actually um, very interesting because as a medical science student, we did a report on this exact topic last year. And it was just so nice to hear you bring it into the conversation. So thank you so much for that. Um, Laura, you are up next. Hi, I don't really have too much to add, but I, because it was just great what everyone else said. But I think understanding the historic and present contexts um, really would help from a perspective of someone that doesn't um, really suffer from racism. I think that to the intersectionality can help you educate and help others because it needs both, it needs to go both ways um, for us to achieve the objective where we don't live in a racist society. Um, I think the concept allows us to understand the differences in oppression and how you can help one another um, and educate others that maybe need educating on the different oppressions others can face. Um, that's all I have to say on the question. <laughs> can, can I just interject for a second? Um, so, and, and, um, um, and I love your empathy, um, Laura. What I wanted to say is that like in, in the United States, they say that $1 trillion is lost on the annual uh, gross national, you know, whatever, uh, due to racism. And that means it affects everybody. So even if you're, if someone is not actively racist and is open-minded, we're still suffering from it because uh, the best example might be, let's say um, your coworker is a person of color and they've experienced microaggressions and they've tra they're traumatized. So they're coming to work and they're not working at their at, at optimal, right? Because they're dealing with PTSD, they can't be as productive, they can't be as effective. Every, so any anytime you run into you interact with someone who is um, who is of, of a different race. They're coming. They're not um, living their best life, and they're not as productive, and they're not where they should be because they're dealing with a heavy burden. So it does affect your life as well because you're not going to get the best a uh, best treatment, the best education when you're dealing with this level of society that's not optimizing their you know not living their best life. So we're, we all do suffer from it. No, I wasn't saying that I don't suffer from it. I mean, in a set, in the traditional sense, like I'm not personally or, you know, oppressed because of my race is what I meant. Um, and yeah, that's, I, I'm aware that we all suffer because, as a consequence, but I don't personally, on an individual level, in the day to day, in an um, active way, realize it may be passive or, you know, trickle down to me. But yeah, that's what I meant. Um, yeah, that was a great discussion from, from everyone. And I feel like Maureen made a really good point um, in that racism does affect us all, but racism is also bad in itself, right? So um, really interesting. And I also really liked um, what Katusha said about how intersectionality is actually about oppression as opposed to our, as opposed to identity. And I think for me, I thought it was identity. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, so number two, when did you first hear 
about intersectionality and how has your definition of it changed over time? Um, if we want, we can kind of reverse order and go with Laura first, please. Um, so I first um, heard of the idea in my second year gender course that I took part in, in first semester. Um, I had never really had any knowledge of it beforehand. Um, and it was quite revolutionary, actually, when it was explained to me. And, you know, it, it was given context into how um, into the modern day society. Um, and then, if I'm being honest, I didn't think about it actively much more after that until it came to us in advance eve designing the power up program um, so every program advance eve had offered before um, was in scottish borders and the scottish borders and um, for those of you who don't know it's a very undiverse part of scotland and um, so any participant we had was white and scottish and had never left the scottish borders they had lived there their entire life it's a very rural part of scotland and people tend not to leave once they're there, born there. Uh, but we knew that Edinburgh and especially Edinburgh University is a very diverse university where people have come from all over the world and have different oppressions. And the um, idea and the challenges into starting a business as a female entrepreneur uh, would be different for everyone in the audience and every participant. So we looked at it a lot more and considered intersectionality when we designed the programme. And that's when my understanding of it and my definition changed in very recently, actually. Um, yeah. That is really cool, Laura. That is very cool, especially as an international student. I think globalising the perspective that the university has when they look at us, when they treat us, is so important to me specifically. Um, but yeah, Maureen, do you have anything to add or can you please answer the question? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, um, that was, that was, that's, that actually mirrors my experience as well because, you know, new terms are brought in and then you have to kind of like shake your head and kind of figure out how do I, you know, balance this and what in my learning and then seeing how it changes how you how you see the world all of a sudden, right? Because because it becomes more nuanced. So when I was developing Black App, um, and at first it was really like it was it was it was a reaction to George Floyd and thinking, how can I help keep uh, black people safe? And then as um, as we got into developing um, the the prototype and and the MVP what I started to realize was the whole need for, for safety and what, um, what that meant, because it wasn't just about having emergency situations, because thankfully not, we don't all call 911 every day. We call, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a rare thing that, we, that any of us has to call 911 or we're in an emergency situation. So I thought, well, how can we serve and how can we help improve the quality of life? So I started to look at, um, I started to look at not just black people, but uh, Latino, um, Asian people, but also the LGBTQ community as well, because they're, they're all groups that have experience, has different, have different experiences that affect the quality of life. And so as, as I continue to develop it, I thought of how we can overall improve all of these, all of the, all of these situations. And then even going into, into the area of sexual assault, how we help keep women safe, not just like, oh, what do we do in the case of an emergency, but let's take it one step before that. How do we talk to men about, um, about sexual assault? You know, how do we have those conversations before a situation ever happens with consent, right? And so it was, it was just really fascinating when you start thinking about how do I create safety and how do I improve the quality of life from not just a black perspective, but a female and a gay, et cetera. Because even um, in the States, well, maybe two blocks from where I live, they had a mural up of uh, uh, an uh, artwork that represented 25 women, transgender women that were murdered. And, you know, and, and I never think about, oh, what's, what's the situation for a transgender woman? She must be fine. You know, she's usually taller, bigger, stronger, can defend herself. But then you start hearing their stories and you realize, oh, my God, there's a need there. And how can I address that? So um, intersectionality has been like so empowering for me as an, as an entrepreneur and, uh, and a safety creator. Mm -hmm. 
brilliant experiences. Um, I first heard of intersectionality when I was undergrad, but it was uh, in a curriculum that it was pretty much Eurocentric. And I, I graduated in a university. It was the first university of sociology in Latin America. And yet it, we, we read from French scholars and scholars from the US and scholars from the UK or even scholars from the UK who were now identified as Brazilians because, you know, they were those uh, those T-shirts with flowers and they were cool. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it was an Eurocentric curriculum. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so intersectionality was not very well contextualized. And for a while, I understood there was the complexity of identities until the point that I was invited to write my master's uh, project years before I actually started my master's. And I understood that it would not fix in a, in a methodological understanding or to have a realistic uh, project for a research in one or two years. If I wanted to have an intersectional approach that would suffice, that it would cover all the layers of identifications uh, of queer black groups, right? Because I cannot, otherwise I would reproduce the same idea that uh, hegemonic understandings are reproducing a black, black people. All black people like, I don't know, um, fried chicken, whatever, something silly, or well, all black women from Brazil dance samba, right? So I would do the same if I tried to understand that all black queer people would have the same kind of identitarian uh, self, I don't know, way to address uh, to their identities or even self-classify. Uh, so some queer people could identify as, as men, some queer people could identify as I don't know, bisexual as well. So there are some uh, ideas of gender, sexuality, and other dissident uh, and identifications that could be really complex. I would never finish that research. Basically, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, because our identities are very rich and also they are always in movement. So, so one day we wake up and we say, mm, I think I'm queer today. I think I'm going to stick with that identity for a while now. And then over the queer, we also add something different that we start living in a different place. For example, in the Brazilian context, it may be a favela. And that adds to our identity in terms of how marginalized communities are, are seen in society. So you see how complex ongoing this movement is if we address intersectionality in a misreading or misinterpretation from this Eurocentric or hegemonic perspective. It's actually very dangerous because we can reproduce those hegemonic ideas that we try to criticize. So this is my trajectory. I, I learned by making the mistakes, right, of trying to do something that would not fit in a research project and it would not fit in actually an anti-racist project. How can I be anti-racist if I'm just addressing to intersectionality as a very like passing a rule over identities? Um, so now I, well, it, it changed the way I, I saw not only the way I understand the concept but the way I embrace intersectionality, the way I, I see the world, and the way I I try to address to the power imbalances that I I bring to to the room sometimes, and I I try to address with affect and the revolutionary aspect of how loving and and caring relationships can build, understanding that people suffer different oppressions and they should never be put in hierarchies, they should just be understood and uh, having the space to be discussed. So I think that is changing also my way of teaching and my way of supervising, my way of being in the, the spaces. That was, okay. go Jen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go for it, you first. Um, Katusha, that was an amazing, that was such a cool answer. And Maureen as well, and Laura, just because um, 
I'm doing political philosophy right now. And as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a philosophy student and we're looking at what the point of equality is. And, you know, we've, we've slowly throughout the semester already come to the realization that equality cannot be generalization. And I think that's what you said, Katusha. It's like equality needs to be mutual care for one another because that's why we want equality, right? Because if we force people to kind of be equal and see everyone as equal, they're not going to see everyone as equal because mm -hmm. they're being forced to. Um, so amazing, great point. Um, Jen, over to you to ask the next question. I was just gonna say, I think it was, yeah, all the answers were amazing. Um, and just, it really emphasizes how complex this topic is, you know, it's not just a one layer type of a thing, you know, and I really, I know I keep on relating back to Maureen in terms of healthcare, but it's just something that really does like register with me because I've done lots of research into it. And I just think it comes down to giving more people like places on like the systematic board, like just really trying to change the system. Um, yeah, so Okay, so on to the third question. So this is a long one, so <laughs> just be warned. Um, women are politically disadvantaged in power structures led by men worldwide. How can an understanding of intersectionality, for example, understanding how different women face a different blend of discrimination at varying degrees, be applied to society practically so that girls and women can have aspirations and achieve them? Would you like me to repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay um we can start with maureen maybe first okay okay um so yeah that is a very complex question but I'll, I'll i'll kind of approach it the way um i've seen it so i've made a point of, of having a very diverse female friend so if my friends start looking all the same it gets me upset it makes me uncomfortable because i realize that's not how the world looks so i try to make sure that um uh, every person is represented because it, it changes the way my, my mind works like we, our brains need that challenge just as human beings we need to keep moving things around or else your your, your brain like any muscle will get stagnant right and stuck and so when i've spoken to women like i i really like to have deep conversations even if it's just an acquaintance and kind of get to know who they are so i understand their challenges and the thing i've constantly been saying um for the past uh i'd say three years is encouraging women who have an opinion to run for office because um, it's not so much about her winning, but it's about her being on the podium and sharing her perspective because her perspective is, is challenging and stirring up something else in another woman. So it's not about like, you have to look for small wins. Like uh, if, if, I'm, if I say I wanna be the president of the United States, I'm not gonna go and run for president. I'm gonna run for the board, the, the school board or school or, um, class president or just wherever I can find a platform to speak and to give my opinion because I can't even emphasize how important it is. Like in in um in psychology there's a, a theory called de-individualization. So the group acts on mass, right? And but if that one person deviates, it can change the course of how that group is acting. So it really is important for us to disrupt and use our voices, even if we're not like completely on point, because you'll get corrected, right? But you have to speak up and you have to, we have the, we have the luxury of democracy. We have to you take advantage of that wherever you have a chance to be in leadership or be close to leadership gravitate towards there so you can be an influence to someone even if you can't gravitate to the top you can be next to the top and influence how that leader um treats women and it treats minorities and treats transgender you can be such a um such a, a force um without being the face by using your superpower which is you being who you are and speaking up I, I hope that was the answer. 
Thank you so, so much. That was an amazing answer. Well, honestly, thank you. Um, Katusha, would you like to take the next, not the next question, just the next response, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it made me go through the conversations we've been having about healthcare and the exclusion, the systemic exclusion. And I'm going to give you maybe two examples, maybe two maybe to illustrate how we can think about an answer, although I don't think that question has an answer yet. But we are building as a community, as a society, as anti-racist movements, a possibility to think about the future, to think about, to dream about the future, because to dream is to, is to take the political responsibility to imagine something that does not exist yet. Because even democracy or even the, the things that they are not made for everyone, right? They are expecting exclusions because we are living under a capitalist society, even those societies who don't identify as such, but it's still, we are living under uh, uh, this construction of modernity that expects dead people to to be killed necessarily or to die uh, like covid uh, in order to survive so that is no longer acceptable as long as we don't accept that it's our duty to think about what we want to accept so that's why i don't think the the question has an answer per se but it's it's a path that we're taking so um I was thinking about the the example of one of my um, my research. The PhD research was with Black Brazilian women, and one of them told me a story about how they suffered when they had a baby in two thousand and eight. And at the time, they were screaming in Portuguese for anesthesia, which is anesthesia, and they and the nurse didn't understand. Uh, they ended up staying for 20 days in the hospital to this to the moment of the, the the conversation they didn't even know why they had to stay in the hospital for 20 days and at the time this is my research I looked at the at the uh, historic of uh, how the NHS were treating uh, the obstetrician uh, side of NHS right the the public health care and I saw that women used to stay 1.9 days average at that time when she gave birth. Why? Her, her, the time that she stayed in the hospital was 20 days. So this is the kind of a, a, a oppressions that we see that it's not only talking about women, but it's talking about black women from a different nationality with a different language. And that's why the intersection of that makes so, so much sense. And going further about the healthcare, because Maureen mentioned um, uh, in, the, in the previous question, um, we were, are talking about the, the, the trials on research, you know, for new medication and stuff. But this is like the modern or even the positive way uh, when they started the trials for HIV uh, AIDS treatment. Only white men uh, were selected for the trial for the good drugs. However, historically, the black community has been the target to do other kinds of research, let's say a more experimental ones. And uh, I, I want to address to how black women suffer in that way, because there is a book called Black on Both Sides. If you are interested in having a more queer conversation about women or who identify as women, this is a great book by uh, C. Riley Norton. And he tells the story of uh, Christine jo 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 uh, Jorgensen and how they were uh, taken into this medical lab to make the um, the transitioning, uh, the gender transition, uh, going through a lot of surgeries as objects of experiments. And you imagine the manipulation and the treatment of those black bodies that are surviving to this day and with the trauma to serve as an experiment that are giving or providing for so many white men the to be celebrated or to be recognized as 
you know, the evolution of medicine as such. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that as we also talk about black women, um, as people who identify as women, people who are women, trans women, or however they want to identify with this classification or this identity. And maybe invite you to reflect whenever you are using the, the, the term female, if that's actually a critical way to engage with the kind of identity that has been marginalized, are we transforming this into a biological conversation uh, or we are trying to challenge this classification and go further to do that what I'm inviting you to do? Imagine different futures and I think language is one of them. So that's my, my answer to you. Uh, the use of language, the, the way we address to each other is something that I believe can be very relevant because that's how we understand and we try to think in a different way. And that's how these ideas are sinking in and maybe normalizing something that is more beautiful, more caring, yeah, more revolutionary. <laughs> Um, no, go for it. I'm just gonna say, take it away. So, <laughs> um, in terms of um, how we can support girls and women to achieve their aspirations, I think drawing on advanced youth experiences that where I can contribute because that is the very the, those exact words are the um, mission of advancing youth, uh, helping females achieve their aspirations. Um, so through our research and why me and my mum came to start Advancing Eve is because we found that the resources and the support out there um, wasn't relevant and wasn't relatable to women and um, the culture around female achieving their aspirations is quite competitive and comparative. So to take a business example, um, if you see a boardroom of 10 men and one woman, women will often believe that they need to take the female, the woman's seat as opposed to um, taking any of the other male seats. They don't see them as equal competition. Um, that's not just me saying it, there's research that backs that up. Um, so I think that by, by taking that into consideration and offering support that is great for women, that's how we can help them achieve their aspirations. And taking an understanding of intersectionality is the way that you make that relevant and relatable to each individual woman. It's everyone is unique and everyone has their own relative challenges and their own relative oppressions. Um, and that's what we try to do through Advancing Eve, whether it be through finding the right mentor that can help someone with their specific challenge or training courses that are diverse and cover a range of topics and challenges that females and women can um, face throughout their life. And also, I think um, an intergenerational um, angle is also great to help women achieve their aspirations. You can learn a lot from people that are older and that people and actually people that are younger than you, too. Um, um, so a great example is um, my other business um, is in a three generation family business that I started and then actually recruited my mom and my gran. And what I've taught my gran is how to use tech, but she's also taught me so much that I wouldn't have learned without taking the voice of someone that's older. And um, so, yeah, that's my um, contribution to how you can actually help girls and women achieve their aspirations in a practical sense and not just looking at it broad and how you could actually make changes today so yeah. um thank you so much laura and um so i am conscious of time so we have about nine minutes which means that um i'm actually going to stop jen and myself from asking you guys questions and like any attendee like now's your chance please put um in the chat bar like any questions you may have and I'll read it out and we'll try to get the panelists to, to answer it. But in the meantime, while well, that's happening, um, Laura, you said something quite interesting. You spoke about how through Advancing Eve, um, oh, we got another, yay, we got a question. Okay, we'll read it just now. Um, through Advancing Eve, you spoke about diversifying the programs you offer women um, in order for them to achieve um, their aspirations because that's what Advancing Eve is about and when I read this on your website I was like amazed like I was amazed because that needs to happen but I think I question that 
I have for you is like, how are you diversifying um, your programs? Um, so the program that we have with the uni is made up of two, three key components. The first is through workshops, which are soft skill based. So the one we had last time um, last month was on visioning and how you can actually use that process to vision who you want to be and what, where you want your business to go. Um, so in terms of that, we've got um, journals and we've done research from a variety of sources. So similar to what was mentioned earlier, we're not just taking information from UK, British, white male voices in terms of the research that we use to actually design the workshops. And second um, component that we have is we have an audience with events with role models. And research has also shown that for um, women having uh, someone they can look to and hear their story that's relevant and relatable. Um, so what we wanted to do in with Advancing Eve is not just have white female speakers. We wanted to have a range, different ages, different businesses, um, different race, different everything, where they're from. So actually one of our speakers is a woman called Poonam Gupta. She um, moved here from India and she started up a paper business um, and she's great. Um, Poonam Gupta OBE, I'm pretty sure I'm meant to say that when you say her name. Um, and she's fantastic and she's really inspirational. We record, Advanced Leave recorded a podcast with her, which was great. If you want to listen, it comes out at the end of the month. Um, and also she's going to be one of our guest speakers. So we made sure to pick the right woman for the people that were actually going to be listening to her speak um, and that's how we've focused and then the third element is just you get um discount and advancing membership but that's kind of separate and we don't really design that any differently um for the program but yeah no oh, that sounds amazing Laura like damn great cool um and I think I want to get more more involved in advancing you so look out for me as well um <laughs> Jen, do you want to kind of read out Debbie's question and I'll read out Rachel's question and anyone else feel free to kind of put your questions. We'll try and answer it before the session ends as well. Okay, sure. So um, Debbie's question is, what do you think about the defeminization of black women and how can it be addressed and tackled? Anyone just feel free, free to jump in whenever. Well, I think part I think that's um, part of the whole like uh, myth about the strong black woman or angry black woman, and um, I think I think it's really important as a, as a black or brown woman um, to really find your own voice and find your own tone and listen to yourself. Um, as and just before I even preface that, I really wanted to get out this point. Um, women are amazing. We 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 were we were so intricately inter, intricately made our bodies are you know they're 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 aligned with the moon you know there's something so earthy about who we are as women that's beautiful and powerful and i understand you know transgender women and people who identify as female but there is so much power in identifying um yourself as woman and understanding what that means apart from the rhetoric about what a woman is and should be, but understanding how you're made and listening to your body and listening to the earth around you and centering yourself and finding your own voice from that. And I think that's part of, you know, the answer to this question. Don't see yourself as a group, find your own voice, quiet yourself and find your own voice and then find things that nurture your soul. And it, you can't, nobody can, can uh, take upon themselves. Oh, going to re-feminize black women no you can re-feminize yourself and then let yourself be an um a, a role model for others but it's really hard to change group thinking and i did want to uh, uh, kind of tag on to something that uh, dr bento said about um imagining things you know everything that's been created was first imagined we have to use our imagination we have to we have to write those things that we dream about write those words down and tell yourself those things because if you can think it there's energy behind our thoughts that creates things so if you imagine something write it down write it down put it in front of your face and let it let yourself give birth to it because you have everything in your body that gives birth your words give birth your body gives birth you can give birth 
businesses, thoughts, you know, these things come from words and thoughts, right? So own yourself, own yourself and claim yourself and find your own personal voice. And then I think you'll answer a lot of the challenges that are in the world through your own experience, through your own life experience. And Maureen has dropped the mic. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that was absolutely great. Uh, I don't think I have anything to add regarding uh, that question. Um, uh, maybe just to highlight the fact that, yeah, this idea of defeminization of black women is embedded in so many stereotypes and so many uh, ways to disregard uh, how black, what black women can be, how they can, f how we can feel, how we exist in this world and ignore that existence at its core. Uh, it doesn't mean that all black women need to be feminine, <laughs> but it is, it, it is to uh, take out the, the, those layers that were built through this uh, legacy of coloniality, which is the stereotypes of this being strong, being, being powerful, being, I, we can take everything. Yeah. And allow yourself to breathe and allow yourself to be. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Katusha. Laura, um, understood. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, and yeah, you're free to leave. Um, right. So we have another question, but I, mm, the Zoom may shut off. And if that's the case, that will be us done. If it does not shut off past six, then we can kind of continue for five minutes if Maureen or Katusha does need to leave. Um, but I'll just ask the next question. Um, do you have any advice on how to make sure that volunteer groups for those who identify as women or non-binary people's safety are being intersectional? Um, so it's a very interesting question um, that I suppose you can look at it from different angles, but safety, Maureen, I think you kind of have a complete understanding of that and what you do. Yeah, I, um, so our focus with Black App is really about stakeholders and, and, um, and taking responsibility and building your own community so that with, with our app, which is uh, downloadable, you create a circle of friends um, and, and who are your first responders in cases of emergencies. Um, but we also go one step further and we, and we look for stakeholders like, uh, I'll say, for example, we're going to be looking for corporations like, um, like uh, I'm thinking, you guys, is it um, your drugstore? Is it is it Boots? Boots. What is Yes, Booth. Okay. So we're starting partnerships um, in Canada first so that we can uh, create safe zones so that if you are a woman and in, in, in at risk, whether you're abused or you're homeless, that you can go there and, and ask for help whether it's you need sanitary products or you need resources, they'll be able to refer you. So we're looking to partner to create those stakeholders for, um, for, for women and for people, for, um, for people of color or the LG, even the LGBTQ community. So you know that these are safe places. And also we're looking to reclaim um, libraries because people don't go to libraries anymore, but they can be a really great place for people to gather and have community conversations and create safe zones for the, for, you know, because sometimes when they see a group of black people that they, there's assumed badness or, or criminality going on. So if by reclaiming um, libraries as public spaces where, you know, uh, people of color can just congregate and, and be, feel safe, you know, um, that's part of our work in creating safety. Um, thank you, Maureen. Katusha, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I, I would like to recover the idea of intersectionality uh, when we are talking about this, uh, the spaces also to recover what Alara mentioned regarding her, her business and so on. Um, so I believe that when we are talking about the, the intersectional or the intersectional space, we, and at least I, I'm not really interested in if, 
how many people of color in your group or anything like that. I, I work in Scotland. How can I expect the University of Scotland <laughs> to have the majority of black students? I can, maybe in the future. But my point is, how are we deploying intersectional practices in there? Because as much as you can do like uh, and, and diversify the group, it's amazing and it's great because it's inclusive. But understanding that the oppressions that that group are, experiences, are experiencing are not necessarily the representation of everyone because we have different experiences, but understanding that they can be intersectional, so according to uh, people's nationality and race and gender. And this is why I believe it's at the core of queer spaces and how people who identify as women and non-binary peoples can, can, I don't know, feel safer in spaces where, um, where their experiences are validated and, and welcomed. Uh, not ignored or silenced as we often experience, or even worse, when they suffer the oppression just because they are who they are. Uh, so I believe that this, the, the, the practices, the intersectional practices are more important than how people in, understand as intersectional environment or diverse environment, right? Um, it doesn't work if we have like a trans woman, non-binary, a black woman, an in, a, a, an Indian or indigenous woman, sorry. Um, and then we are reproducing the same idea of capitalist idea, the that people are, are in hierarchies, that people are vulnerable and reproducing that kind of understanding. So this, I think, would make the difference if that makes sense. And yeah, and just try not to put those those experiences into hierarchies of oppressions. Um, Patricia, so if I understand you right, you're talking about not like tokenism in the sense that you kind of, you're not putting all these figures up and saying, hey, because they're saying this, what they're saying is diverse and it advocates for equality and it advocates for, for their best interests. Because I think from a very informal standpoint, I think, you know, as a person of color, I feel like sometimes I need to check myself because I experience, you know, internalized forms of racism. How I think about myself is informed by how others treat me. So it's it's a very important point you make and something that resonates with me as well. Um, but on that note, I'm kind of done with my questions and I do believe there's no other questions from attendees that are coming in. So I think we can kind of close this up. Jen, you can have final words. <laughs> Just yeah, thank you so much for coming and thank you so much to our panelists for giving us an amazing view and perspective of this <laughs> topic that we had today. And yeah, I really, I really learned a lot and I'm so excited to do more research into both of you. Like I literally really looked up Maureen. <laughs> so yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this thank conversation you. and have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Oh, bye. Mm -hmm. Bye, Marine. Bye, Katusha. Bye, Emily. Bye, everyone. Bye.